Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. This video is a continuation of my series on global heat waves to Arctic monsoons. The climate mayhem that is ongoing in summer 2018. Okay, so I talked about the, uh, this article here in the Observer is a good article about the heat waves from Algeria to the Arctic. It's actually, they're also occurring in, um, we're getting severe drought in Australia and heat much higher temperatures than, than normal. So one of the big ramifications of, of this is crop failure. So across Europe, across parts of Asia, across lots of North America, it's just wherever these heat waves, these heat domes are persistently located, there's a huge um, evaporation, um, loss of moisture from the soils. And unless you've got irrigation um, or some other, um, some other means, your, your crops basically wither and die. And this will greatly affect food yields. So, um, so Europe, Northern and Central Europe, crop failure and bankruptcy. States of emergency in Latvia, Lithuania, the sun's baking Swedish fields. They only got 12% of their normal rainfall. Ottawa is in a severe drought right now. We had record rainfall in July of 2017, something like almost 250 millimeters of rainfall. That would be about three times the normal amount. Well, this July so far, we've had almost like next to nothing, like five or 10 millimeters or something. It, it's like, so this, this is part of weather wilding or weather whiplashing, okay? We've had year, you know, you go from a year of huge amounts of precipitation to the absolute opposite extreme of extreme drought and then you can go back to huge amount of precipitation the next year and so on. And this is happening as our climate system continues to destabilize, destabilize because of the loss of Arctic sea ice, making the jet streams all screwy, basically. Um, over 30 degrees Celsius in the Arctic Circle. 50 wildfires in Sweden. Okay. Uh, agricultural losses estimated to be up to 8 billion Swedish kroner. Um, you know, Netherlands, same sort of thing. Um, okay, there's some sprinklers. Uh, okay, June was the second warmest on record. Um, so governments need to start, you know, helping the farmers to survive this type of year, you know, if you have crop insurance, etc. Um, okay, so and these are basically fires in, this is in Germany. Um, an Irish dairy farmer, the drought won't break us, but our feeding costs are 50% higher than last year. All the money that we'd normally put into approving conditions for the cows is going to winter feed and buying forage. Okay, so huge amounts of, of uh, water stresses going on. Now, this article um, is about the, the Ru Russian's a major exporter. Of, of wheat. So their crop is expected to fall to 67.4 million tons due to these droughts and stuff. So this is a drop of 21.5% from 2017. If this materializes to this amount, isn't worse. Um, and that brings it on par to the previous five years, the average of about the previous five years or something. Okay, so it just shows you that there can be large fluctuation in the output of the crop, you know, plus or minus 20%. Well, the, the, the record year was 20% higher than what this year is forecasted to be. This is one place. The problem with these widespread global heat waves is this is also happening, not just in Russia, it's happening in China, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in North America, it's happening in the bread baskets, bread baskets of the world. So this is how climate change is going to bite and kick people in the butt. There'll be global food shortages. Um, if they don't happen in the next few years, 
Um, I would be surprised. I would say that they would track the, the, the loss of sea ice. You know, we're heading rapidly to a blue ocean event. I think that's one of the biggest risks of a blue ocean event. Even though people in Russia, oil companies in, in Russia and the US, et cetera, are, are all salivating at the prospect of going into the Arctic to, to drill oil and gas. Meanwhile, food supply globally has a very good chance of being uh, wiped out or severely constrained as we head there. So they look at the yield, basically they get an average yield of 2.61 tons per acre, for example. You know, compare it to last year, they know the area in hectare, sorry, this is per hectare, so they can get the total forecast. And so overall, uh, the, the, the summer crop down 20 odd percent, winter wheat decline of about 20% from last year. Okay, so, so this is an article on that. Now remember what happened when, when Russia lost its 40% uh, of its grain crop in 2010. There were food price spikes globally and it triggered the Arab Spring. That was when the jet stream was stuck. Um, so Pakistan was in a trough for about a month. This is J July 2010. And Russia was in an, a, a ridge, heat wave, over 30 Celsius for a month. Russia lost 40% of its grain crop, and that tr caused, uh, they didn't sell, export any grain that year, and Pakistan had, three quarters of the country had, was flooded out basically. Okay, so these things are, are happening, they're ongoing, they're happening now. Um, this is the wildfires in the Arctic Circle. When has this happened before? Okay, there's, the problem with this is not only do you destroy the forests and release all that carbon to the atmosphere that was trapped in the forest, in the trees, but the trees are no longer extracting CO2 from the atmosphere. So CO2 levels, the sinks are failing. Not only that, the smoke um, depends on the air circulation, but this, a lot of this smoke, this is north of the Arctic Circle, a lot of this smoke gets up into the Arctic and it, it, it coats the, the snow and ice. It coats the ice and glaciers on Greenland. It coats the Arctic sea ice. It makes them darker. It drops their albedo, okay? Um, and it makes, it contributes to the Arctic quickly darkening. So not only is it darkening because of the loss of sea ice and snow cover, but the sea ice and snow cover that's there gets all of this ash and carbon on it. And uh, you know what happens in on your driveway when you have snow on your driveway and then there's a brown, uh, a patch you know if it's asphalt underneath and there's a dark patch then the, the snow melts very quickly around that so same sort of effect here this is a huge problem okay um and uh norway italy you know can, uh people are sending um water like these things are so unusual here that we don't have the equipment and the resources to fight them these heat waves up in the far north, you know, who has air conditioning up in these countries? Nobody. So when you get these heat waves and these people there, their bodies aren't acclimatized to the heat. So they have to treat this very, very seriously. This is, this is life threatening to many, many people that live up in, the, in these countries. Um, uh, huge fire, you know, we've seen forest fires on Greenland, if you remember from a few years ago, there were some massive fires. You know, there could be sparks. There's many sources, right? It's like a tinderbox. It's just ready to go. It could be sparks from a, a car, machine, people having barbecues, cigarettes, lightning, okay? As we get more extreme weather events, as we get torrential rains, we get more lightning. Lightning is on the rise, and therefore it triggers more fires as the planet warms. Um, also, when you're, you know, when you're already at 30 degrees Celsius, there's an ignition point for materials and you know the hotter the ambient air the surrounding air the closer you are to the ignition point the easier it is for the fire to be to be triggered okay so so this is a huge problem now i mentioned that this is not an el nino year so this is an enso update and this was just updated July 23rd, 2018, hot off the press, probably within hours. So basically, and so the, the conditions are neutral, like 
So not an El Nino, not a La Nina. Sea surface temperatures are near to above average across most of the Pacific Ocean. ENSO neutrals favored for the Northern Hemisphere summer 2018. With the chance of an El Nino is increasing to about 65% during the fall and to about 70% during winter 2018 to 2019. Okay, so we're neutral. So imagine what these heat waves would look like when you have an, an El Nino. And I'll just show you here on this temperature graph. Okay, this is global surface temperature relative to uh, turn of the century, previous century. So what we have here is you have a spike here in 1998, and you have a spike here in 2016, and these are super El Ninos. So global average temperatures significantly rise. Um, this is global surface temperature, quickly rises because all of that energy that's stored deep in the ocean water in the Pacific is released as the Kelvin wave comes across, as it breaks the surface. You get all of this heat release, which causes these temperature spikes here. And that changes uh, conditions uh, globally, but it can also, you would expect that the heat waves, like we're having now, in a neutral year wouldn't be as, as severe. You know, you'd, you'd think, okay, well, if we had a super El Nino going on, well, maybe you could explain and say, that's why we have so many of these heat waves now, but that's not the case. So this is very concerning. So I'll go back here to some of the key figures. I won't go through the whole thing, but basically this is August, 2017. Here, here's where we are now. And this is a uh, latitude across the Pacific. And this is the degrees, this is the sea surface temperature anomaly from across the equator. So from five degrees north to five degrees south. So you can see this whole area here, this is generally warm, right? The water gets piled up there, but th then the water can slosh across here for an, an El Nino. And what you can see here is just in the last few months, okay, the temperature anomalies in this section went from slightly colder than normal to warmer than normal and this is why the probability of an El Nino occurring is is increasing because this yellow is starting to cross here the whole Pacific here whereas before it was just confined to the uh, western side of the of the Pacific but it's not huge okay it's not significant it's not huge we're not in an El Nino yet um, these are the different regions this is so this is across the Pacific to South America here, um, from Aust Australia is here. Okay, so Nino 4, 3.4, there's different regions. And this is the temperature, sea surface temperature departure, averaged over a week, the most recent. So 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, minus 0 0.3. So what we're seeing here is these are the anomalies here. So we're seeing Nino 4 go positive, you know, 3.4 go positive, 3 there, and one, 1 and 2 haven't gone positive yet. When these things all start going positive to a more significant level, that's when we have an El Nino. So we don't know for sure it's going to happen. I told you the probabilities that, would, would, that it would happen. Okay, this is sort of sea surface temperature anomalies, June 24th to July 21st. Okay, so slightly warmer but not significantly warmer. We're not up here, so it's not an El Nino yet. Okay, we'll just keep going. This is another view. Um, this is weekly anomalies. So what happens from week to week? There's a bit of warming, okay, but not significant. Um, another view of it. Um, this is the, um, okay, this is the, uh, the the index here. What what actually? Let me go on and upper ocean heat. Um, this is outgoing long wave radiation. So when the water is warmer, it's emitting more radiation. So that's another way you can tell. Um, wind anomalies. This is the heat. Okay, across the whole basin. So you get this Kelvin wave coming across, bringing the water across. And what I do want to show you is. Uh, the Oceanic Nino Index. Okay, so here we go. So these are El Ninos if you're above the red line, the red dotted line, and La Ninos if you're below the dashed line. And you can see the 1998 strong El Nino. 